Thank you so much. Right. I've heard the, the voice of the lady saying, yeah, this is me, thing is being recorded. It's like, what's up, what's up? Anyways, thank you so much for, uh, you could guess how this talk's gonna be, starting with shrooms and talking about the snow. Uh, anyways, it's great to be here. Thank you so much, Chris, for having me. Thanks for everybody who's here on the talk. Um, like. It's okay, I, I get it. I can just, we've been talking for the last like five minutes. Um, uh, yeah, thanks for being here. Um, I know it's a strange times and probably a lot of you are anxious like I am, but it's also good to talk about science. My name is Parisa Hosein-Zadeh. I'm a new assistant professor at the University of Oregon. I started my job a little shy of uh, two months ago uh, at the Knight Campus Center at the University of Oregon, where it is standing at the land of uh, Kalapuya. Uh, people originally. I am going to talk about computational approaches for designing and understanding peptides. Parts of this talk are um, about what I did during my postdoc and the rest are about what directions my lab is going to take. All right, so let's first talk about peptides. Why peptides are important? Why are we interested about peptides? And um, what are we trying to understand here? And before I get into the talk, if you have, how does the questioning work? Do we ask the questions at the end or should we, um, because I don't think I can see the chat. Uh, um, so how we often do it is, is the pre-mobile group. So folks tend to just interrupt if that's okay. Perfect, yeah, that's, that's perfect. Yeah, just unmute because I don't see the chat. So don't type on the chat, uh, unmute and jump in. Okay, now let's talk about peptides and what they are. So peptides are a small stretches of amino acid. And when I say a small, I mean something between, anywhere between two amino acids to 40 amino acids. And they play a lot of essential roles in biology. I think one of the most famous peptides is insulin. It's a hormone in our body. And it's not just one example of peptides. A lot of that are hormones. A lot of peptides play very essential roles in signaling in neurons, in guts, and all around our body. In addition to playing a role as, as hormones, some peptides are discovered as toxins from a lot of different organisms, the spiders, um, cone snails, you name it. A lot of the peptides that people study and discover are actually found either as toxins or as peptides that help um, the organism defend itself against things that are attacking it. We have them in our skin. Human defenses are some of them that are antibacterial. A lot of plants secret these types of um, defense, defensive uh, peptides that people are studying. So they're very important. You can see that they have a lot of structure, a lot of different shapes. They come in different sizes. And like all other macromolecules, their shape define their function. So in order to be able to understand these peptides, we really need to have a structural understanding of them. In addition to uh, in addition to, can, can people silence themselves? I can hear myself, it's a little disruptive. <laughs> Just mute, sorry. Uh, so in addition to playing these uh, roles as a natural peptides, peptides are also attracting attention as um, alternative therapeutic modalities. This slide is, is inspired by Chris Paul, I should say. <laughs> um, so here you can see the spectrum of two of the most common therapeutic modalities, antibodies and small molecules. And you can see that they are at two extreme of, in terms of size and molecular weights. Antibodies are great at binding to things, but they're also super, super huge. So they can't access intracellular targets. Small molecules on the other hand are small. They can access intracellular targets. However, traditionally they uh, have been great at binding to pockets, deep pockets where they can fit in and they haven't been so great at targeting shallow surfaces. So a huge portion of potential drug targets, as somebody estimated about 70%, is not accessible to either antibodies or small molecules. And they call these 70% of potential drug targets the undruggable um, proteome or the dark matter of the therapeutic parts. And people are hopeful that peptides and peptide-like molecules, so I use this general term of peptides for peptides and things that are similar to peptides, 
uh, people are hopeful that they can be a promising complementary alternative uh, to target this undruggable pool. But in order to be able to design these things, in order to be able to uh, find peptides that have the features that we're interested in, we need to be able to have control again over their structure. So it all really boils down in the ability to understand their structure and being able to design for predefined conformations. And it may sound easy, but it really is a very difficult challenge understanding peptide structures. First is that although peptides are very small compared to proteins, they're really too big still for doing some um, molecular dynamics, accurate molecular dynamics calculations or DFT calculations, uh, something that's dominant for small molecules. There are some advances in using machine learning algorithms that um, speed up this process, but still it works on very, very small sizes of peptides. Additionally, we have very limited a number of structures of peptides available in protein data bank or Cambridge structure data, data bank. Um, just, for, just to give you an example for a class of peptides that we call cyclic peptides, there's about 10 structures in PDB for the ones that are smaller than 14 residues. So you can see that the data, it's a very sparse region in terms of available data. So it's really not amenable to machine learning based approaches. Like we are far away from tens of thousands of data that you require for those things um, traditionally. And finally, although peptides resemble proteins in their building blocks and they're made of amino acid or amino acid like molecules, in many ways, they're very different from proteins. Uh, I just mentioned that there are classes of peptides like um, cyclic peptides that they have constraints they, the smaller ones don't have any secondary structure elements just because they're too small to form those secondary structure elements. And they can have a lot of unnatural amino acids like the amino acid, lots of amino acids that occupy different portions of the Ramachandran space. So because of these differences, they can access uh, shapes and conformations that are very, very different from proteins. So all the amazing methods that we know about protein structure prediction, you simply cannot use them to understand and study structures of peptides, especially those that cannot take secondary structure elements. So all this is telling us that we need another way for sampling these peptide structures, a way that's not so dependent on accessibility of data and also on the protein informations on proteins. So I'm gonna, um, so how do we, how do we, um, approach this problem? How do we go about designing peptides with given structure and to studying peptide conformations? I just want to start the uh, rest of the talk first by design, which may seem backward because a study should come before design. But uh, if you bear with me, you realize that it does make sense. And this is one of the cases where designing is actually in some ways easier than understanding what's happening in nature. And my focus here is going to be on cyclic peptides, and in particular peptides that their N and C terminal comes together and closes. Uh, so it's just a circle. There's no residue one. It's, it's all, it all comes into the circle. And the reason for it is first, it made the problem of approaching, uh, it made the problem much more tractable. And second, because um, these constrained cyclic peptides are very attractive as therapeutics because of the stability, additional stability that they give. Okay, so how did we solve this problem of using a novel approach for uh, sampling peptide structure? We decided to use um, the method that uh, my colleagues develop is uh, inspired by a robotic method that's called kinematic loop closure. So in the figure here, you can see, let's assume each of these parts are one arm of a robot that can move around these axes. And I tell you, hey, you have this six piece hand or whatever, and you want to make sure that it comes together and closes, what do you do? So you randomly move them and you probably get a close solution here. Um, someone else may move them randomly and is not as lucky as you and get a solution that's not close. And then you can try again, you can get another close solution, but now in a different conformation. 
Now you can imagine that this method can be expanded, like a very similar strategy can be expanded to peptides by just assuming that each of these arms that I'm talking about is one amino acid. It can be either in L conformation or D conformation. And I'm just gonna. And um, you basically start sampling this and rotating it around. Uh, and it, instead of moving it around uh, an axis, you're changing it in the torsion on the space. So you change the phi and psi angles of the amino acids. And um, we tried to do that. So we made a chain of all glycines. And the reason we use glycine is that glycine is um, a residue that can access both the L and the D space of Ramachandran space. So it would give us the added flexibility for uh, being able to get more uh, structures. And we started running this method multiple times on different sizes. I'm showing you, oops, sorry. I'm showing you here the numbers for eight mers. Just to give you an idea of what I mean by we ran it many times. So we generated, we ran it multiple times, around a million times, and we generated about um, 700,000 solutions that were successfully closed for an 8 mer. And please note that these are just backbone glycines at this stage, right? So we generated 700,000 shapes of glycine chains in a circle. And the question we had at this stage was that, First, how similar or different these are? If, I, if we want to cluster them based on their shape, how many different clusters we can take? And also because this number is very big and we, this method is super, super fast, could we actually sample the entire possible shape space of these class of molecules, this closed microcycles that we're talking about here? Um, so we went ahead and did a simple study. So let's say I'm starting to sample and I'm just checking how many new clusters uh, I'm generating. And here I'm clustering. So these, each cluster is a, is a unique shape. I'm not counting the redundant data, okay? So let's say I'm at 2000 step. I have some number of clusters. I continue sampling. I get more new clusters. And if I keep going and going, at some point I reach to a stage that I don't see much of a, an improvement. It's saturated. And what I mean by that is that here is uh, 6 million samples. Um, and in, uh, in order for me to get more unique clusters, I need to computationally spend a lot more resources. So this is the place that we say we are about exhaustively sampled this whole shape space. Um, and you can see that the number now has dropped from 700,000 to 15,000 roughly. Um, great, so it seems like we can actually, for these smaller sizes, we can actually sample possible, all the, po almost all possible shapes, this is approximate. Um, and we can show that for up to 10 residues, this is possible. Now, what should we do with this glycine, flexible glycine backbones? We know that eight glycines can make 15,000 shapes. It's time now to try to lock these shapes into place by adding amino acid side chains to them. Um, and we use Rosetta software to do that. Uh, these are all actually done in Rosetta. So in the process we call design, we add amino acid side chains to them and ta-da, we get something that has really good energy. This is where we start scoring and throwing out things that don't make sense. Because this whole sampling is kind of, it's all completely random at this stage given glycine, not completely random, but it, it, is, it uh, samples, Conformations that won't physically make sense. But after you add the side chains, this is where we also cut on the conformations that don't physically make sense. And you can see that the number drastically dropped from 15,000 to about 600. So now Rosetta helped me find sequences that uh, are good for this shape. But I'm not sure if this conformation that I have is the best conformation for that sequence. It may take on other conformations that have lower energy. And that's why we need to do um, an added in silico folding method. So let's say I have this shape, I have this sequence, and then I run kick kinematic loop closure on it. This time, instead of randomly moving things, because I exactly know the identity of the amino acids in there, 
I can narrow down this movement to only the torsional spaces that this amino acid would like to take and can take. So I get a confirmation and then I can compare it to the original design and get the RMSD of it and the residual energy and I get a spot in a plot like this, RMSD versus energy. And if I continue doing that, I get more points on this plot. And if I run it enough times, and usually for these peptides, it's about 10,000 to 20,000, you get a, something like this, which we call a folding funnel, which some of you might have seen before. Um, there, this is a good folding funnel. You can see that there's a difference in energy between the lowest, um, lowest energy conformation to the second to the second minima in the function. And the lowest one is much closer to the design. It has low RMSD. And the approximate number we like to use is about five for peptides of this size. So if we see something like this, we can say, hey, this peptide is likely gonna be structured. It's possible that you get something that's completely flat, uh, which is no good, it's not structured. And it's also possible to get something that have a minima somewhere far from your original design which suggests that it may be folded, but into a conformation that's different from what you were hoping for. Um, so uh, great, this is another stage where things get cut up a lot. Not, a lot of these shapes don't form that nice funnel, they're not structured, but we still get 21 unique shapes that are at least computationally consistent and structured. And it's a lot more than what you could find in PDB or uh, chemistry structure database, which is three. And if we do that for different sizes, this is what you get. Uh, we get in total about 200 highly structured scaffolds of these microcycles. Um, now the question that you may have is that do they actually work? And the answer is yes, they do. They work really well. Uh, we have 12 structures of different sizes in shorter ranges, seven and eight minutes, they work really, really well. And as you get bigger, it's harder. The success rate goes lower, but still they work really nicely. Now, um, I mentioned that these peptides, we wanted to first show that we can actually generate these structured peptides, but the whole goal was that these microcycles would eventually be used as future therapeutics. So is this something that is doable? And you need two things for that. It needs to be stable in the body and you should, probably be able to change the residues that I put in there and add the functional groups that you want. So we sought to change, check these things, accuracy design. Um, the first one was a stability assay and we used a cocktail of proteases for checking this that mimic what probably you could see in your guts. So let's say you add your, you add a 40 mil protein that we know is a structured, we know is a stable. We add this to this mixture of proteases and we just follow it on LCMS. And you see that it's completely gone after one hour. Now, if we add one of the peptides, a 10 mer, you can see that after 24 hours, half of it still remains. So it's very, very stable. Um, if we remove the cyclic bond, it goes away much faster, which is not surprising. But one thing we also wanted to check was that is the fact that this peptide is structured also adding to its stability or not? And in order to check that, we, what we did was that we generated another sequence that has the same amino acids, but we just shuffled the order. We closed the two ends, so it's a still cyclic, and we tried to test it. And as you can see, it's gone much faster than the actual test, which is really interesting because at these really small sizes, it's kind of surprising that shape is still this important. Um, what about being able to mutate them and add new functional groups. Usually what you do is that you run SSM and we try to do the same computationally using this folding funnel that I talked about as a proxy to whether it keeps its shape or not. This is the funnel. I talked about it qualitatively, but we also came up with a method for having a quantitative measure of how good is this funnel, which we call PNIR. And, um, what it really is trying to show is that how likely it is for the peptide to be in here uh, if it's a structured versus if everything's random, pretty much. And um, if it's closer to one, it's 
structured. If it's closer to zero, it's really not a structured. Everything is random. Um, and we, I'm, I'm just going to show you, show it as a red to blue color panel. The blue means it's folded. Um, so for these peptides, for each of the positions, you can change them to all the 20 amino acids, the same chirality, as well as the mirror image of it. And we can assess the pinier for all of them. And the bottom line here is that if you notice, almost all of it is blue, except for this one residue, which is this proline over here. And you can pretty much mutate every amino acid to everything else, maybe except for prolines in here, as long as you keep chirality. So you can use this as scaffolds and functionalize them in the future. So now the question is, um, could we computationally design this and um, make them functional? That's the second part of my talk, just going from a structure to function and how it affects our ability to design. The function that we thought about uh, was Binding again because of the therapeutic relevance of it, and also because of its computational, its computationally being interesting and challenging. Um, I chose the target histone deacetylases. Um, they're very important classes of epigenetic modifiers. They're overexpression seen in cancer. Most importantly, from a computational perspective, they are very challenging targets. They have a relatively polar pocket with a lot of other molecules, some of which are very low entropy. Uh, there are 10 homologs that some, some of which are super, super similar, and you have flexible loops all around the pocket. And all of these are nightmares for computational design of binders in general. Um, but we know that naturally peptides exist that bind to this with high affinity and also selectivity. So the question we had was that, can we computationally design something that has low IC50 values similar to the natural products? And is it going to be selective? Can we design something that's selective? Um, so here's the pocket. Uh, we use an unnatural amino acid. I'm calling it SHA. It's uh, basically a very long cysteine that goes all the way down to the pocket and coordinates to the zinc in the active site. And what we first thought we we're going to do is that we are going to use that scaffolds that I generated, dock them onto the pocket, very similarly to how you design protein binders, let's say, and we get great binders. And it really didn't work. Unfortunately, that way, it turns out that binding with a loopy shape things rather than a hel uh, an alpha helix or a beta sheet is much, much, much harder. Um, and mostly because the pre-generated scaffolds that were designed to be very structured didn't fit the shape of this pocket really well. So we decided to move away from using those pre-generated, highly structured scaffolds and try to generate peptides in the pocket that are maybe less structured but can fit the shape very well. Tried a lot of different things. I'm just going to go through the one that worked the best for us, which is also the most, uh, I think, computationally expensive one. And that is for exhaustively sampling all the possible conformations that you can get. So what, what we did was that you have this anchor in the middle. We extended one residue before and one residue after. And for each of them, we checked all the possible um, torsional space of it. So that you can imagine it's like a fan that's moving around. And for each of the positions, we also mutated to all possible residues. Just to give you an idea, this is one of the, the plots that we get. So each column here is a residue that we're mutating it to. And each row, it's one of these tiny lines is one of those degrees that we're moving them around in, uh, in the torsional space. Uh, it's phi and psi combined. And we are measuring different interface metrics. So this is, for example, delta, computational delta delta G of binding. Blue means it basically doesn't mind. Bind yellow means it binds pretty well. So what we did next was that we picked those regions that had best value. And then we tried to extend the peptide out of that, use kick to close it and then make the binders. And it turned out to work much, much better in terms of binding affinity. Just 
showing you picture of one of the structures that we got to see how it sits in the pocket. Um, and in terms of binding, so this is where the anchor stands. It binds with it, um, its IC50 is about 5.4 micromolar. And these are the peptides we tried. The taller ones means that we had two at this range. So the pest, I should say with this method, most of the things bound much better than the original one. And we get something right off the computer that binds with about seven nanomolar IC50. So it's like three orders of magnitude improvement over the anchor which is super exciting. And it's on par with the natural peptides I was talking about. In terms of selectivity, however, we're still far behind perfect. You can see here uh, histondacetylase 2, and I'm putting histondacetylase 6 here as a comparison, which is something at the acetylase that has very similar pocket, but we know that it's possible to get selective binders to them. And you can see that we have things that are slightly better than uh, in terms of selectivity, but not much. Interestingly, we got this peptide completely randomly that binds to listen to acetylase 6 with one nanomolar affinity. It's really, really great. I think it's like the second best peptide binder to listen to acetylase. And it, it has a hundred times, it's a, it binds with a hundred times selectivity over HTAC2, which is astonishing. We couldn't get a crystal structure of that with HTAC2, but we have a structure of that peptide with HTAC6. And it's kind of depressing to see it. It's, uh, it binds in a completely different structure than what it was designed. Like overall conformation is the same, but it's bent in a strange way. It interacts with a lot of waters in the active side. It just shows all the problems I was talking about at the very beginning. And it also highlights the fact that there's a trade-off between a structure and function, at least in this case, is that the peptides that we designed to be super structured didn't really fit the pocket well. They had relatively good binding affinities. They, they are almost there here, but not that great. But as you start moving toward higher and higher affinities, you get into the region that the structure, your control over the structure is much lower and the peptide, what we model in the active site in computer is very different from what you get um, realistically. So there's a lot that needs to be solved in terms of being able to model these interactions. And that moves me to the next part of my talk, which is about modeling. And this is a topic that my lab is working on. So it's pretty new and it's also, there's not a lot of data here. <laughs> so I talked about challenges in understanding peptides of structure, but one thing that I didn't mention, and I just um, went over really quickly in the previous slide is that because these peptides are so small, they can take on multiple conformations in solution that are relatively isoenergetic. So they can uh, easily switch between conformations without, um, lots of entropic costs. Here I'm showing you three different conformations of cyclosporine. Cyclosporine is one of, I think is the best studied cyclic peptide. Um, it's an FDA approved drug. It crosses the cell membrane passively. And here you can see in green right over here, the structure of cyclosporine bound to its target. In blue is the structure of cyclosporine in solution in water. And in uh, orange is the structure that people think it takes in the membrane. They got it in the organic solvent. And these are the ones that we could get a structure of. Molecular dynamic simulations show that cyclosporine can take a lot of different conformations. So in reality, when we're studying peptides, if we're not talking about the ones we designed to be really, really, to have really, really sharp, sharp funnels, the more accurate picture of a peptide uh, conformation is not one structure, but an ensemble of different structures. So you can think about, instead of thinking about cyclosporine having one conformation, you can really think about a probability distribution of different conformations. And this probability can be calculated using Boltzmann distribution if you have access to the energy. And if we think about peptides in this way, what happens, like, 
any reaction that involves a peptide can be um, modeled as moving from one probability distribution as a moving from one probability distribution to another probability distribution. So really the problem boils down to can we sample robustly and accurately these distributions and can we assess the energy of each model? And um, people have used molecular dynamics simulation to kind of capture these different uh, conformations for a small peptides in solution, but it's a slow. And also molecular dynamic simulation start to be really, really difficult as you increase the complexity of your system. Like the more unnatural building blocks you add, the more difficult it becomes. We actually showed before that we have a system that can very nicely mimic the same thing in a much faster way. Kinematic loop closure, in essence, is sampling the conformational landscape of the peptides. So now the question really is, can we use that to model peptides behavior and for cyclosporine, we showed that it can actually sample all those three conformations that I showed you before. So the idea here really is you run kick on a peptide that you're interested in, you do some clustering, using Rosetta as a proxy for energy, you can then generate these distributions. And we know that this energy is at least good enough in water because we can design things and model things well. And then you can use this uh, distributions to then start studying and understanding the peptides of interest. And the model system we want to apply this on is trying to be able to predict and model passive permeability. Um, the reason for that, a lot of people are interested in that because that's what really uh, makes peptides stand out in, the, in uh, comparison to other biological uh, therapeutics like antibodies or bigger proteins is that they can passively cross the cell membrane. But it's really hard to predict that. For me, it's interesting because the process of going from a conformation in solution to a conformation that crosses the membrane and going and back to the conformation in solution is really what we explain. So if you have the ensemble in water and you have the ensemble in membrane, you should be able to predict this. Um, we know we can have it in water, so the problem really boils down into having an accurate model of that in peptide conformations in solution, in membrane, sorry. But unfortunately, score functions are trained on aqueous solutions for proteins, so that's a problem. Also, the number of peptide structures in organic solvent is really, really, really small, which is very troubling. So what can we do? How can we guide this score function for uh, predicting this permeability? Uh, my lab uses low resolution data in order to do that. And uh, the low resolution data that we use is a temperature coefficient that we know we have access for 100 cyclic peptides for. And 100 may seem like a very small number, but compared to zero, it's, it's really huge. So let's, let me walk you through what is a temperature coefficient really quickly. This is my peptide. It has a bunch of protons, backbone amides, and we know that you can see a shift in the NMR for each of them. Um, so what people do is that they change the temperature when they're running their 1D NMR. And you get something like this. As the temperature drops, you can see a shift towards higher value in the NMR spectra. And this slope is the temperature coefficient. For a very exposed amide like this one, there's a big negative slope. For something that's hydrogen bonded and not as exposed, it doesn't change that much. So really, this temperature coefficient can be used as a proxy for hydrogen bonds and solvent accessibility. So now you can think about it this way. Um, you have a peptide sequence. Uh, you have sorry, uh, still hard to control. So you have a peptide sequence. You have the temperature coefficient data, which I said we do have access to for uh, almost 100 peptides. Now what we can do is that we can sample the conformations using cake. You, we have this cluster of conformations. For each of them, we have we know because we have the structures, we know the hydrogen bonding pattern, so we can define um, 
some values of accessibility or hydrogen boundedness. And because we have Rosetta score on them, we can get the probability and we can define a loss function basically. That's the probability multiplied by the differences between the actual numbers for the hydrogen bond exposure, uh, for the hydrogen exposure in the amide and the number in these structures. And because these probabilities are defined by energy, which is approximated by the score function, changing in the score terms can really help lower this uh, number and bias this, this distribution toward conformation that better resemble the actual structure in organic solvent. Because we don't want to get nonsensical solutions, we own, and because we only have 100 test sets, we are going to only change a score term such as that makes sense to change, like hydrogen bonding, solvation, or electrostatic terms. Use Nelder mid optimization, at least for the first pass, that's what we're using. And um, yeah, and luckily there are five, uh, high resolution crystal structures from this set that we can use to see whether the conformations we're converging to actually do make sense and are com com comparable and com uh, with the uh, experimental data. Things are still running, but our current data shows that it actually does work. Um, we're in the process of making it better and tweaking it. Um, and then in the future, one thing that we really, really like to do is to use peptide design to create a representative training set for this purpose. People really like to study peptides that they know cross the membrane. So all of these peptides really look the same in many ways. They have uh, similar compositions. Here I'm showing you the um, network representation of all possible trimer sequences. And I just chose trimers because you can see them easily and you can plot them. Uh, you can see there's so many clusters. The colored ones are the ones that have composition from literature values. So a lot of the space is untouched. So we're gonna use peptide design to cover this entire space to have a non-biased and representative data set for a studying. We're also going to be working on expanding these uh, capabilities for peptides with non-canonical building blocks, with bridges, like being able to uh, predict where the con uh, constraints are, and also add linear fragments to a cyclic peptide, which a lot of peptides of interest are like that. And finally, we really like to use this method because uh, binding is similar. You can, you can imagine binding as going from um, an ensemble in solution to a bound conformation. So can we use these methods to predict the binding affinities? And uh, more ambitiously in the future, can we use similar studies to be able to know exactly how the peptide docks into the binding um, site? Yeah, so with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. This is our building. This is a picture of our building um, that's kind of drawn. It's amazing. I hope COVID goes away and you can come visit us. Um, I put the information of my lab over there. Uh, we are working, in addition to peptides, we're working on some protein-related stuff. Go check. Uh, and yeah, uh, we have open positions for postdocs. And if you're interested to talk and chat about peptides and proteins, I'm my email is here too. So thank you so much. I think I talked so fast, Larry. But I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks, Parisa. Actually, um, one question I was kind of wondering about is yeah. um, how often are there uh, these multiple conformations? Is this like a, is this because of like the small size that you're aiming for that this happens quite frequently and you can't get away from it? Um, it actually is not just, it's, it's very common. It's more common than one, but you may have, you may think. Um, and it's not just observed with these very small cyclic peptides. A lot of the linear peptides that form helices when they bond, bind also are random disordered things in solution. So we see that with a lot of peptides, not so much with the very constrained ones, I should say. The ones that have multiple disulfides and bridges, they, they, don't, they don't have this problem. Thank you. Um. Hey, thanks for your talk. Uh, can you go back to the slide where you show uh, this blue yellow uh, uh, chart 
uh, like with rotational uh, uh, stuff on residues, and um, I didn't quite quite uh, got the idea behind the chart. Okay, this is uh, was this no, 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 at the, the the beginning the blue, of uh, when you rotate, uh, when you showed, you started with this oh, okay. uh, uh, on the on the. I'm sorry. I'm gonna stop sharing and then reshare, okay? Because it's uh, I, I can't es es escape the I can't escape the the thing. Uh, okay, sorry. Okay, so was it at the beginning of the? It's when you started to talk about this particular usage on this. Uh, uh, um uh, example you had with the binding site uh, where you started to design uh, oh the blue and yellow uh, rotation residue back yeah, rotation, rotation and stuff. okay okay residues got yeah, it yeah. got it okay i'm just okay. gonna share my screen again in this format so that you can see okay this one yeah exactly okay um, yeah, so the way it's, this is not the best picture, I should admit. Uh, so the way it works is that this is the orange residue here, right here, is my anchor. And um, what I did was that I extended it. And then I basically rotated the whole thing. So like I changed the phi and psi of this residue um, in different bins. Um, oh, and I oh, just I sampled, see. yeah, I just sampled the whole phi and psi pair that made sense, if that makes sense. Oh, okay. And then for I each of I them, uh, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. So you, you extended that with uh, different residues and then it's like all rotations. Okay. Yes, yes, exactly. All right, exactly. All right. thanks. Um, of course. Okay. Risa, the, the whole idea of, of getting across the membranes, I mean, it's such it's such a holy grail. It's really exciting. Um, just wondering, have you tried Rebecca Alford's new um, Franklin energy function? Did that help in any way? Yeah, I should I should try that. I did these before she she made those. So yeah, I that's on like the top of my list. I I'm not sure. It's really hard because when you train something on proteins, there's always a high, <laughs> high chance of it not working for peptides. But still, I think it's worth trying because at least I think it's a better starting point than just the water score function. Yeah. Um, and then just uh, to follow up on that, so is the, the overall strategy, if I understood correctly, is to have a, a peptide that has a sort of a stable structure and solution in a different stable structure in a nonpolar environment. And then that that is sort of the hypothesis for how you mediate like membrane translocation. Yeah, so so what we're trying to do is not so much trying to design for it, it's mostly trying being able to predict it. And um, because the data set we have is there's no structure for it, we have no control over how structured they are. So the main idea here is that, hey, we get this ensemble in solution and we get this other ensemble in uh, membrane and uh, we know how they look. So we, we want to generate ensembles in membrane first. That's the one we're trying to find. And we have some low resolution data that can guide us to train a better score function that mimics that. So that's like the first step. Uh, unfortunately, no, they're not structured necessarily. Act many of them, I think, are not. That's why people haven't reported the structures on them. So it's going to be a little messy in terms of calculating the differences in the probabilities. But also, that's that's going to be the case for most of therapeutically relevant things, anyway. So. So about <clears throat> the passive permeability, is this an accepted concept, widely accepted, uh, or is there another 
I heard other people say, well, if it permeates, there is a salute carrier that we just don't know about yet. How, how um, sure are we that this passively just meanders through the membrane? Um, we don't know. That's the, that's the easy answer. But the reason people know, okay, we do, we do know, that's not correct. Uh, so the way people measure passive permeability is that um, at least artificially, they use an artificial membrane. So everything's like, it's water on one side and there's an artificial membrane and they check if they cross to the water on the other side. So I'm, I mm. don't know, yeah, if there's anything else that can mediate that. Um, in reality for uh, cell permeability, we don't really know for many of these peptides, whether they are passively permeating or whether it's active. But for this specific set, because they use this artificial membrane, it's, I think it's most likely passive. They just go through. Yeah. Yeah, and they also are, it's not super surprising because they're very, very hydrophobic. So it kind of makes sense. Actually, um, since we're on the slide, um, I was kind of curious is, so when, when it crosses the membrane, is this the, that population, that orange population that sort of, I, I guess I was imagining a scenario where you're, you would sort of become that orange population and then you start going into the membrane. Like, and does yeah, that, I, is that what needs to happen or is it induced or does that population induced upon hitting the membrane? It's, um, so for, it's a really good question and it's a really, really difficult question too. I think for, uh, for a small molecule style things, people are almost sure that you need to transition to that population and then cross the membrane. And the uh, crossing is uh, basically derived by the fact that the, you have a change of concentration, right? As you, as you go inside, the concentration is changing. So it's driving it to go more towards the conformation. For peptides, it's tricky. There are, um, there are CPPs, cell penetrating peptides, that most of the time they touch the membrane and that touching the membrane causes them to make a shift in their conformation and then go through the membrane. Those are really very different from the cyclic ones. Um, they're, they're helical, they form a helix and that makes them cross. For these ones, I think it's still the consensus is that most likely they have to, there should be a small initial population that can cross the membrane. Um, and there's no evidence that interacting with membrane, at least for the most part, can cause that shift. So, but it's an it's an unknown. I I don't I don't know a hundred percent what's the correct answer. Um, and expanding on that, so for the uh, the ones that you said, right, they, that touch uh, the membrane and then they change the conformation. Uh, what's the assay like? How, how like do we know that like yeah good question <laughs> that's that's actually not my that's not one of my interests but people run md so i think that the main reason they think it happens is uh, molecular dynamic simulation mostly um and i think with the um, I'm, sh I'm sure they have done i i'm sure they've done experiments on it but i just know of the md simulations that show that. Um, and it's like a little far from my areas of expertise. So I don't really know what they are the exact experiments people did. But yeah. it's okay. it's a big MD field on it, yeah. Thanks. Uh, Parisa, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could explain the term um, folding funnel 
really quick I, I was a little bit confused about um about those those figures yeah definitely thank you so of course yeah yeah um so it's a jargon rosa the jargon really that we use so um <laughs> yeah 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 so this this is this shape is a folding funnel okay. the reason there is and they call it funnel is because is it true it's because it looks like a funnel i guess this um these each of these dots as i explained is a possible conformation that your mm -hmm. um, molecule can take mm -hmm. and uh, the place of it depends on its energy and how far away it is from the actual original design model okay. so because the dots kind of funnel into your design structure it's called the folding funnel it's I a see. mimic of how it can be folded and it funnels into the final structure if it works i guess but yeah sergey and chris and all the others who are here and know that you can correct me if this <laughs> explanation is not accurate enough. Risa, I think your slides here, like showing the folding funnel is the, the best representation and explanation of it I think I've ever seen anyone from the Rosetta community give. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I struggled with it myself many times. So. No, uh, I mean, it's an inspiration. Uh, I'm totally gonna steal these ideas and make a slide deck that <laughs> walks through it in a similar way next time I have to explain it. <laughs> Go for it. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Well, I guess if there's no more questions for Parisa, um, sharing. thanks. Thanks again for, for coming to present really excellent presentation. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. This is, this is a fun group. Definitely. It's, uh, it's nice to be able to talk science on an otherwise stressful evening. Yep. Distractions are good right now. Thank <laughs> you.